we move the clock forward to the conversation about 10A. What was different about that? Well, part of it was the fact that it wasn't just a deletion of G60106B, fidelity, mirrors, chastity, and singleness, but it was a replacement and an affirmation, once again, of faith and character and the constitutional questions. In Ralph's resource document, you have uh, the exact language, which is really helpful. Because what we're noticing around the country is there's a lot of misinformation about what is now known as G2.0104, or 10A. Um, so it's really important. I also have uh, a guide uh, that I'm happy to share that More Like Presbyterians, the group I work with, um, placed um, in July uh, when G2 came into being. I mentioned that experience because, for me, the bottom line is pastoral care. Bob Dykstra at Princeton says that it is impossible to, to do pastoral care unless you're known as an ally for LGBT people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people. He said it is not possible to do pastoral care if you're not known as an ally, a safe person. So I would say on this side of the conversations about ordination equality, that it has been nearly impossible for the Presbyterian Church collectively to be a safe place for persons like me. So there's the pastoral piece. There's the question about polity. And it's really important that all of us, um, myself included, tell the truth about what G2 is and what it's not. It allows for the ordination of qualified lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender persons serving in the church in the same way that it allows for qualified heterosexual people. Um, so that's a huge advance. Um, I would love that it would be a full affirmation uh, of God's lavender children, uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender person, but really what it does is clear the deck and creates a place of equality. So there are persons within our tradition that are very concerned uh, saying, well, we have to ordain gay people now. No, you don't. Um, and it isn't just any gay person any more than it be any straight person. Of course, uh, in our tradition, uh, ordination is confirmed in community, uh, which I'm appreciative of. So call to ministry, gifts, qualifications, all those things are still part of the equation. Does that make sense? Because today, in Middle Tennessee, uh, there was an effort to bring back fidelity, marriage, chastity, and singleness. I know in Plains and Peaks in Denver, what was placed into their sexual misconduct policy was fidelity, marriage, chastity, and singleness. So there are a lot of folks <coughs> trying to bring back those old kinds of teachings and understandings. Uh, which brings me to the prophetic piece of this. The first one, pastoral, second, polity, third, the prophetic. And I'm so grateful. Um, recently, uh, Hunter Farrell and the uh, Mission Division uh, re released a letter that was sent to Grady Parsons, to all of us. Did you know that the retired Archbishop Desmond Tutu sent you a letter? Yes. Many of you have read it. I'm seeing the nods. Uh, but he wrote a letter, an open letter to the Presbyterian Church and sent it to Grady Parsons, our state clerk. And he began it with these words. It is incumbent upon all of God's children to speak out against injustice. It is sometimes equally important, says Desmond Tutu, to speak in solidarity when justice has been done. He goes on to say to you and me, to all Presbyterians, for this reason I'm writing to you in my belief that in making room in your constitution for gay and lesbian Christians to be ordained as church leaders, you have accomplished an act of justice. Sadly, it is not always popular to do justice, but it is always right. So that's the end of my five minutes, which people who know me, I'm a southerner, I now live in northern New Mexico where time is manana. For me to do anything in five minutes is like a miracle. You, you didn't make it, but we didn't stop. <laughs> okay, so it was five and a half. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. I, I'm going to start with a question and then ask for everybody's questions and discussion. 
how do you think 10A affects young adults and young people in the church? Oh, it's a great question. Um, in terms of our witness, uh, what we've learned over time and uh, is that persons under 40, under 30, under 20 don't care if somebody is gay or straight collectively. Uh, Barna, a conservative Christian think tank, uh, has done surveying of Christian young people, and they're like, no, we don't care. Um, and so what this means, of course, is that many young people have said, I don't want to be part of a church that discriminates. Um, and so this opens the door, frankly, for the Presbyterian Church once again uh, to um, be a church that doesn't discriminate. Um, and so it's, I think it's a helpful, helpful witness. Um, and if one looked at sort of an inverted triangle, uh, Ralph, it would begin with the persons who are actually LGBT. Um, and then parents and friends and family. Uh, and then people who wouldn't want to be part of a church that discriminates. And people who see this as a justice issue. And then people that go, you know, I don't know if homosexuality is a sin or not but I think there are more important things in the world for us to be concerned about. Uh, and then that would include nearly everyone. Questions? Comments? We can't, we're Presbyterians. We can't take this. <laughs> I'm Jim McKellar. I'm also a former stated clerk of the Senate. Um, how is the present polity situation in our denomination now different from what it was before 1996 when the Chesapeake provision was added to the Constitution? Go ahead, Earl. Well, on the one hand, we don't have the constitutional provision that, as you observed, came in in 1996. So uh, we do have a clearer statement in the Constitution about examining on an individual basis. The other constitutional issue, and the Constitution has a number of different layers. On the one hand, there, there's what the book says. Uh, there is the matter of what the General Assembly has uh, declared in authoritative interpretation, that's what that's called these days, it was different than 78, about what the book says. And then there is a set of case law uh, that is what the ju permanent judicial commissions at the various levels and finally at the General Assembly, what they have interpreted what the book says and what the General Assembly has said. And probably the biggest difference is that yeah, in, in 2008, ooh, am I right? 2000, no, it's 2010 that the General Assembly voted to remove all of the uh, authoritative interpretations that had been given hitherto in the matter of ordination of people in same-sex relations. So the action that was taken in 1978, which I, you're correct, that's part of the ethos in which we live, but it is no longer has constitutional authority. So uh, that we are really at the point where, as the task force on the purity, unity, peace, purity, and unity of the church has said, this is where the determination of who is qualified for ordination really does rest squarely in the uh, councils that are responsible for the for ordination. So are we then 